Hi everybody, welcome back to our channel. Today I'm going to be doing a recap review on Teen Wolf Season 5 Episode 20 and it's called Apothesis. This is the season finale to Season 5. Really big episode. So I really want to start out talking about my thoughts on it, let you guys know how I felt, what I anticipated, and then I'll probably break the scenes down for you bit by bit. Initially, I thought that, the, that going into this episode, there was a lot of things that they were going to have to resolve. We had the issues with Theo, we had um, the Dread Doctors, the Beast, Mason, uh, essentially being um, lost inside the Beast in a way. So there was a lot of things I felt that needed to be addressed and a lot of things that were going on. So. I was not disappointed in any way. This episode was amazing. I really liked it. My my mom who watches with me really liked it. So I was very impressed. Everything from start to finish I felt was done really well. There was however, if I'm being completely honest, one part and it had nothing to do with the story, okay? It had to do with the effects of the show, like the actual screen effects. And that was towards the very end of the episode. For some reason, they switched from real time, like looking backgrounds and like, it looked like how the show normally is. And they went to some sort of like CGI moment that to me just, it threw it off in a way. That was just my only criticism, but it had nothing to do with the story, how the episode developed and, you know, the conflict, you know, everything, the resolution. I felt everything was done really good. So, initially, I was, I was thinking, okay, well, does this mean that since the last episode that Mason is gone forever because when he transformed into the Beast and then the Beast transformed into Sebastian Valet, I was thinking maybe Mason's gone forever. However, we find out that is not the case in this episode. So there was many things I thought that I wanted to talk about, but I wanted to break it up to you in about five to seven core scenes and I'm going to break them up like I did. Um, the episode that made a Jevudan. So that's what I'm going to do this uh, this video. I'm going to break it down into core scenes that I felt should be addressed. So I'm going to start out talking about Theo and his story plot. So to start out, Theo goes and he's inside um, his little area like of the tunnels. I don't know where he's he usually hangs out. I don't know what part, but that's where he's at and he's there with Tracy and Tracy's helping him back because of um, his run in with the beast and he's pretty hurt and he's like gashed up in his abdomen area. So Tracy's trying to see if there's like a way to help him or how they can save him and if he's going to die or whatever. So at that moment, they kind of share an intimate time together and they kiss and uh, this kind of threw me off right here because nowhere in this whole season have I suspected that those two would even be liking each other much less that they would have like progressed in a relationship that it would become intimate so that kind of threw me off when they started kissing but it turned okay the scene turned because Theo dug his nails into her back and he ended up killing her. I know. I, I, I personally, I didn't really care too much for Tracy. I thought she, she kind of annoyed me. But, I mean, it's kind of messed up that he would have killed her like that. So then he took her powers. And I think essentially that's what he's trying to do. He's killing one by one his members. Like, he killed Josh and then he was able to use electricity. <clears throat> Excuse me. He killed Tracy, now he's able to have Canama Venom. So, you know, it, he's just like offing all his people. The one I think is kind of interesting is that he hasn't tried to kill Hayden, and he hasn't killed Corey. I mean, I really don't see what he would get out of killing Hayden to begin with, or why he would even want to be invisible like Corey. I don't see what Corey's powers would do for him, but I mean, they're still in his pack, so I would think that maybe they would have 
had a shot at getting killed by Mason, or not Mason, Theo. Why am I saying Mason? Weird. So, at that time when he kills Tracy, Deucalion walks in and he's talking to Theo and he says, and I'll quote this, you know, Theo, someday your willingness to stab anyone and everyone in the back might turn out to be your downfall. A little foreshadowing there, I see, but we'll get to that a little later. So we're going to move on from Theo scenes on to the next. So now I'm going to talk about a little uh, on the Argents. So we're, le we're left off, we're continuing from last episode. So it's the same night. Theo... Uh, he's in the tunnel, so we're gonna leave him at that. So we're leaving off where the beast got away. Uh, the hellhound was after him. Now we see that Gerard and Chris are in their car and they're following the hellhound. And Gerard it has like this grin on his face, and Chris like tells him like, "Okay, so you found it, didn't you?" And Gerard is like, "I've had my speculations." That's not exactly what they're saying, but that's like. A paraphrase for it so as it turns out Gerard is holding a cane and that is in fact the same pike that Marie Jean used to kill Sebastian Valet back in the 1700s so I guess throughout all the years down it was fashioned into a cane so they're following him they're left around at that point so we're gonna move on to the next scene so let's talk a little bit about the beast himself. Let's talk about Sebastian Valet. So we, the first we see of him pretty much in this episode, um, there's a man lying on the floor uh, on the road and he's dead and he's stripped of his clothes. And we see that um, Sebastian in fact took him out of his car, killed him. Now Sebastian is wearing the guy's clothes and he's taking the car and that pretty much this is his disguise as to walk around like a normal human being. I know, it's pretty sad. It was really gruesome to see that part, but, you know, let's progress. So, during these scenes that I'm talking about, uh, Liam and Scott, they somehow they managed to get that dread doctor that the beast took out, and they took him to Deans, and Deans looking at him, and they're trying to figure out what's going on or what they can do with that dread doctor. And while that scene is going on, we hear the Dread Doctor being summoned. Somebody is calling him, and we see that it's Sebastian Valet who's calling the Beast to him, and the Beast is outside. So the Dread Doctor gets up, he pushes everybody aside, and he makes like a barricade with all the furniture and everything that's inside the... Uh, animal clinic and he barricades the door so they can't get out at that point and he makes it electric like um, it, it electrified so they would get electrocuted if they even tried to so he goes out uh, outside of the clinic and he meets Sebastian and they start talking but before that um, Sebastian pulls off the mask of the dread doctor and we see like he looks I don't even know how to describe it, like wrinkly, wet, gooey, goopy, and he has like his eyes all messed up and his like blood and it's a whole mess basically. Um, so that's what he looks like. He looks terrible, just terrible. And um, Sebastian looks at him and he calls him Marcel. So we know now that not only are the Dread Doctors using uh, resurrecting the beast as a way to prolong their life, but it's very, very interesting to note that the main Dread Doctor, I think they call him the surgeon if I'm not mistaken, um, he was the one who back in the 1700s covered for Sebastian and he was the one who was going to take the rap, of, of, of essentially, he was going to take the rap for Sebastian and let Marie Jean kill him to hide the fact that Sebastian was the beast. And Sebastian looks at him, and I'll quote another little part here. He says, if this is what immortality looks like, I think you might have been misled. And Marcel tells him, for, it's for you. All of it is for you. So we see that 
I don't know. I just think it's kind of weird how this guy's been obsessed with Sebastian all these years. I mean, 200 and some years, he's just hung on the fact that he has to resurrect Sebastian in some way. I thought that was kind of weird. I don't know. I didn't. I just think like that. That in itself is just weird, but I thought it was super, super interesting to see that that actually is Marcel. So I want to know in what way, how have they been keeping up being alive and who are the other people that are with Marcel? Did he pick them up as he went along and people who were interested in the legend? Or I want to know a little more about the other Dread Doctors and what it is that, why, why they're going along with this whole thing. So Marcel tells uh, Sebastian where the pike is that Maurice Jean used to kill Sebastian or stop him back in the 1700s. And he tells him that the Argents have it. The Argents have the cane or the pike, but they don't know at this point what that it's a cane. I think he just assumes that it's the pike. So that's where they leave off with Marcel. So the next time we see the beast, he goes to the sheriff's station and he's asking Clark, which is Hayden's sister, he's asking her about uh, the Argents and he's trying to find where they're at. So Sheriff Stolinski hears that and he takes him into his office and he's trying to talk with him and he's getting a lot of messages from Styles and he initially he doesn't understand or doesn't know that Sebastian's the beast. So when he sits down, I guess he kind of got like a heads up from Styles and he reads it and then his whole demeanor changes and the beast picks up on that and he realizes that Sheriff Stolinski knows who he is. They go back and forth with a couple threats and stuff. So then then uh, Sebastian decides that he's gonna leave peacefully. When he does leave, Clark goes off on him and she starts shooting him. I think she got a little too heated, okay? So when she did that, it just set everything off and Sheriff Stolinski started shooting him too. So that scene cuts to um, a part where um, I guess Lydia was still in um, the sheriff's station because last episode we seen that she was in the sheriff's station her and Styles. so i'm assuming Styles left and she stayed there when the gunshots went off she probably went out to see what it was if she was in the back room or something so we see that the beast goes to her and when he's about to attack her she screams and tosses him back but we turn back and we see that he actually sliced her throat so at this point we're thinking oh my god did Lydia die but at that moment Hayden walks in and she sees everything that's happening and he goes to her and he jabs his nails into her abdomen area so essentially she's dying too really 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 intense scene we then cut to a scene where Sheriff Stolinski is taking Lydia into the hospital and he's yelling for Melissa to go and help because Lydia's bleeding out. Really, really intense, as I said. So, you know, at that point I was like, oh my God, did they really kill Lydia? Like, are they gonna really offer that way? Luckily, she did not die. While everything is going on with Lydia, we see that the beast took Hayden and or pretty much ordered her around. She took him to the tunnels where the fresco was up where it has the hellhound versus the beast and the pile of bodies on the floor. And he um, concludes that the beast, or not the beast, the hellhound is Parrish. So little by little he's remembering things because he rem he knew that Hayden's name was Hayden, he knew Parrish, and he's using Mason's memory. I don't know how he's doing it, but he's using Mason's memory to figure things out, to know things, know names, places, how to drive, things like that. So he's using Mason's memory or Mason's, I don't know, I don't know how he's using Mason, but he is. He's using him to know these things. For now, I'm going to leave things with the beast there. We'll go back to him because things constantly are revolving around him. So, of course, I'm going to go back to him. But for now, we're going to move on to the next story arc. Okay, so the next story arc is still Malia and the Desert Wolf Corinne. 
and Brayden, and they're still trapped in Malia's house. <sighs> I don't even know. This is so, like, it's chilling how Corinne acts towards Malia. It's, it's sad, like, how she would have so much hate towards her daughter. And when we first uh, get into this scene, we see that Malia is kind of hiding from her. She's trying to be quiet because Corinne is trying to find where at and how she's at so she can go and kill her. Brayden is trying to like take out Corinne with her guns but Corinne's kind of hiding out at the same time too. So we hear Corinne talking out loud and she's telling like taunting Malia about styles and Malia's looking like pretty upset. So you know it's really really rude and mean how their mom acts but I mean to her, she has to do what she has to do in order to kill Malia. So by using Styles, she knows that that's a way to trigger her. So Corinne claims still that Malia stole from her, that she stole her powers. Whether or not she was a willing participant, she's still holding this against her. And Malia's like crying basically or sounding like she is like, she's like, no, I didn't steal anything from you. I don't see how she could, she doesn't see, but Corinne feels that this is like something that Malia chose to do. And basically what she kind of says is that, um, I wrote a little thing down here, here. So that Talia tried to convince Corinne that Malia was a kind of blessing uh, or a miracle, okay? And that um, passing over power from Mother Coyote to the daughter was a beautiful thing, like it was a gift, like something that should be cherished or appreciated. But Corinne, of course, doesn't see it that way. And um, she claims, Corinne claims, that Malia was more like a parasite to her. So obviously a parasite being something that's growing inside of you, that's sucking the life out of you, essentially, really mean. I don't know why somebody would ever want to tell their kid that, but here is Corinne telling her daughter that. So Brayden and Corinne eventually engaged in a, like a fire off with their guns and it's going back and forth in the house and Brayden actually gets shot. So that kind of stunts things right there. And Malia and Corinne actually end up side by side on uh, in what just the wall in between them. And right when they were about to fight, Styles walks in. Okay, so Styles was sent by Scott to do a certain thing and to give Malia something. Okay, so Styles walks in, and right when that happens. Malia actually pushes Styles out of the way because Corinne was just about to shoot him. Okay. I'm gonna leave us right there and I'm gonna go back to Malia and I'm gonna go back to Styles and Corinne and we'll talk a little more about that. But in order to explain a little more of that, I have to go back and I wanna talk a little bit more about the rest of what everybody's doing, essentially, especially Scott. We see that Parrish and Chris are still working together and they're trying to figure out how they can kill the beast. To Chris, he believes that he has to help Parrish so that it could be, as the fresco portrayed, the Hellhound versus the beast. So that's really what those two are going to be up to. While Scott and Liam are at the hospital uh, worried about Kira, or not Kira, um, Lydia, and they're trying to see if she's going to be okay, Scott finally hears the message from Kira saying um, from last episode that she was leaving. And she tells him that she'll be back. Don't worry that she's, if anybody's going to save everybody. And, it's gonna all get resolved. It's because of Scott and it's because of all of them. So he kind of like has a spark of life in him and he's like, I have an idea. And he tells Liam that and then they get like really excited. So at around this time, Scott tells Styles, he gives him uh, something wrapped in a brown paper bag, right? So he gives him, um, he gives him whatever that is and he tells him to take it to Malia 
So that's kind of what's playing in why Styles goes to Malia's house, why he's gonna like get her essentially. So that's where we're gonna leave that off with Styles there too. While everything is going on with all the rest of uh, the pack, Hayden walks into DN's and she's like, I heard you can help my kind or whatever she says. And she's really sick and she's bleeding out and she falls into DN's arms. So that's a really big part, I think, of this episode. And we'll get back a little more to that. So I'm, I know I'm jumping around here and I'm just giving you point by point. But that's kind of how it was happening in the episode. And it was going from one spot to the next to the next to the next. Really quick progression. So that's why I'm like saying things like really quick. So then we go back and it's we're, back, we're still in the tunnels. And Chris and Parrish are going one or like they're going two on one with the beast but while Parrish is fighting him Chris is trying to shoot him the beast so that way Parrish could have some kind of fighting chance they were really working good together I think so to back things up a little bit Lydia after she had gotten her throat cut or hurt by uh, Sebastian Melissa gave her a cortisone shot in her throat, which would in a way allow Lydia to get up and move around because she was really hurt. But at that point, Styles had told already told Lydia that she's the solution they came up with that it would have to be Lydia to shout or scream Mason's name to call him out of the beast in order to save him. So when we go forward and we see Scott and Liam and Lydia and they're trying to track down the beast and they're inside the tunnels, uh, we see that there's water on the floor and of course we see Theo walking in. Theo now has the power to use electricity because he killed uh, Josh so he has that in him now. So seeing that they were about to be electrocuted Liam pushes Lydia out of the way while he and Scott get electrocuted by Theo and Theo just gets Lydia and he throws her down this hole in the ground. Um, Scott tried to help her and hold her up as long as he could but Theo actually stabbed him with cannabis venom which made uh, Scott like like really stiff and stuff so you know how they can't move. Paralyzed, that's what I'm trying to say. He got paralyzed, so he actually let Lydia go. So really, really intense. We're, we'll, go, we'll go back to Lydia. So from there, we see that Scott and Liam are essentially knocked down for the time being. The time has come for Theo to meet the beast. Of course, he fails miserably because nothing that he's going to do is really going to like match anything that the beast has okay so Theo thinks oh you know what I'm gonna use my cannabis of venom and I'm gonna go and attack him when he does that the beast kind of just gives him this look like no we're not no just back off little boy this isn't gonna work and he ends up getting pushed to the side hit really hard and we you know Theo he, he no luck for him there so after Theo gets tossed to the side like yesterday's trash, uh, the beast continues to onward to try to find that pike and do whatever he feels he has to do. So he goes and he leaves and he just leaves everybody there. To him it's like whatever, you guys aren't going to do nothing to me. But while Theo's on the floor, Duke Halion walks in, okay? And with Scott behind him and Liam, and we find out that Deucalion and Scott have been working together the whole time. And we also find out that Deucalion is not actually blind any, uh, anymore. So all of this was really interesting, and that goes back to the beginning of the episode when I was talking about that pretty much Deucalion was telling Theo, like, you know, your own backstabbing is going to be your demise because... You know, he was so eager to like hurt Deucalion, he was so eager to like turn his back on Scott when supposedly he was going to help him. And what happens, Deucalion was working with Scott the whole time. And not only that, Deucalion breaks Theo's neck. 
he doesn't kill him, but he does break his neck. And Theo, of course, is like enraged because he was being like played the whole time. Who wouldn't be pissed off about that? So Theo's pissed off even more now because Duquelin broke his neck, but he didn't kill him. So while Theo is on the floor with a broken neck, Duquelin and Scott and Liam, they're trying, they're going to go try to fight the beast. But Duquelin ends up getting shot in the back. By who? By Gerard. Interestingly enough, Chris and Scott were actually two-timing Gerard because they knew Gerard was self-seeking. They knew he was only out to better himself and to get what he wanted. He could care less about anybody else. And upon realizing that he was being two-timed by Chris and Scott, uh, Gerard gets all defensive and Scott is told to leave while Gerard and Chris are going to engage in a shoot-off. They both have their guns pointed at each other. Which one makes it out? We have yet to see. While Scott and Liam are fighting the beast, Lydia, is, as we recalled, is trapped in some place. Like She fell down some hole, so she's like in some room and it's locked and she's trying to get down, or not get down, get out. While she's trying to get out. We see Kara's sword come through the door. Yes, Kara is back. I was so excited to see Kara. It made me a little emotional. I was like, she's back, finally. Um, so she finds a way to get Lydia out. And so they're going to go to the help Scott and Liam and try to fight the beast. So everybody, little by little, is like coming together in this place. And they're all going to try to fight him. So Parrish is on his way, Chris is in there, um, Scott and Liam, and uh, who else is there? Um, now Kira and Lydia, and Styles left to go help Malia, but everybody is like coming together and it's going to be the big collision that we're like wanting to see, right? We're going to go back to Scott and Liam and they're still fighting the beast. They're trying their best, but is to no avail because the beast is so dang strong. So just right when Scott was about to get killed by the beast, Liam gets uh, the pike and he's about to throw it at the beast. But Scott tells him like, who's going to save Mason? And Liam tells him, who's going to save you? So at that moment, Liam decided that, okay, you know what? If I can't get Mason back and this is what he is, then maybe I have to be the one to end him because he's my best friend. But at the same time, I can't let Scott die because probably there's so much riding on Scott. He's the alpha of his pack. They need him. So it was at that moment, like, Liam was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to have to kill my best friend. If he, this is what this means, then I'm going to have to be the one to do it. He throws the pipe, but misses because the beast seen it coming. Of course he did. Of course he seen it coming. When the beast is holding Scott by the neck, and I think he was like getting ready to rip it off or whatever he was going to do, but he dug his nails into Scott's neck. But as we recall, that is a way in which that some of the supernatural who have the claws can put it in somebody's neck and they can see and access the memories. So, okay. The beast is looking and it goes to Scott's memories of Allison. <sighs> okay, so he sees what he believes to be Marie-Jean, but it's actually Allison. And he lets Scott go and he's like confused, like, wait a second, what did I just see? Like, is that my sister? Well, this guy, like, how is that her now? But like, he doesn't know that it's Allison. He just sees his sister and it was enough time in which that Scott was able to let get like loose of him. While uh, Scott gets loose, Lydia gets there with Kira and she yells Mason's name, but that only made the beast or Sebastian turn and look at her. It did not make him turn yet, so she had to yell even louder, so she screamed Mason's name out. And that was the trick. That's what they needed to do, call his name forth. It's like the beast. In order for him to uh, become fully Sebastian, he had to remember his name being Sebastian Valet. But 
it goes the same way for Mason, that in order for Mason to come back, it had to be the Banshee to scream out his name and to call him forth. She did so, and we see like the body morphing and changing and the beast becoming Mason, and Mason comes like alive again and he falls now this is what gets me a little ticked off he falls and guess who makes himself a, a visible Corey and he catches him why the heck was Corey in the tunnels seeing everybody getting pretty much killed or to the point of it and he did nothing to help that got me a little pissed off, and then the only time he comes and shows himself is to catch Mason. Like, come on, man. These are Mason's best friends. You, the least you could do is try to fight for him, or when he's seeing that Liam missed, maybe he could have, like, like, figured something out, helped in some way. But no, he decided to keep himself hidden until, like, waiting around to see if maybe Mason comes back. I don't, I just like that kind of got me mad about Corey, about what he did. I didn't like that, not one bit. But I was happy that Mason's back. Am I happy about Corey's actions? No, I am not. I think Corey should have done better by everybody. Especially because Mason was like, had that whole conversation with him, like, I want to be standing with who's right in this not who's wrong and then Corey's right there with everybody else seeing everything that's going on and not helping bad bad i say so the beast is like in some smoke or weird form and he tries to run off and this is the beast form it's not sebastian's it's the beast form so he tries to run off and Parrish gets there and he hits him and right when he does that he yells to Scott to, for Scott to throw the pike and Scott does and it lands and it decimates the beast and he's no more at least we think I'm not sure if he's dead for good or if he's if that's where what what they're gonna leave it at I kind of hope so I think I don't think he, they need to be bringing this beast back anymore done enough havoc on everybody there but at that point that's what we see and we see that the beast uh is gone we think okay this is all great they killed the beast everything's good now wrong wrong again theo gets there and guess who has his electricity back again his neck's upright he's going right there and he's about to electrocute them all and just uh kira goes and she deflects it with her sword and i think now kira has in a way of the ability to control the electricity because as we seen last episode she went back to the skinwalkers for help and as they said it came at a price we had to find out that price is we'll get to that right now but Kira at this point is able to use and control her powers so she deflects the electricity and she stops Theo and she tells him um she said, the skinwalkers have a message for you, Theo. Your sister wants to see you. And she stabs her sword into the ground and it cracks and it breaks open. And um, it opens up into this big old hole. And Theo's sister climbs out and she grabs Theo and she starts pulling him down while Theo is screaming his head off, asking Scott to save him and to help him to not let him go down. And she pulls him down with her. And at that moment, the cracks in the floor close up and it looks like if nothing even happened I don't even know what to think about that whole scene was she like come out of how like where did she come out of was she a skinwalker what is what does Theo's sister have to do with anything still I thought that was already said and done with he killed her to become a chimera and I don't know it was really weird I, I was expecting like something different for Theo to be killed or taken out even if he if he is even killed we don't even know like I don't know I'm conflicted about that I don't know if I liked it it was interesting of course but I don't know if I liked it I just I wanted something like a little more fulfilling like maybe uh, they kill Theo or Scott or you know the beast or something you know different but I kind of thought that came out of nowhere it was left like a little more confusing than letting me understand what was happening at least that's how it was for me i still thought it was very interesting though don't get me wrong 
really really interesting so as I said I get I'd go back to Malia right so while uh, while Styles is tossed to the side okay he gets up and he tries to fight um, what's her name Corinne okay he tries to fight Corinne but because her and Malia while they were fighting they fell into um, a coffee table like a glass one and Corinne throws Styles off of her and she hits him and we look and we see a big old piece of glass penetrated Styles from the back of his uh, shoulder all the way through to the front so whether or not Styles was going to live at that point was in question but while Malia and Corinne are fighting Corinne shoots Malia in the stomach and she shoots her like in the arm and then she shoots her again so three times Corinne shoots Malia and at that point okay I was thinking like oh my god Styles is going to die and Malia how am I going to handle this one here so, okay, what Scott referred to was as plan A, get this, was what was given to Styles to get to Malia, and Styles gets it, and he throws to Malia a jar, and that jar had Blasco's talons in it, those talons that um, Theo were gonna, was going to use. And Malia, right when the desert wolf was about to kill her, Malia, or she, the desert, excuse me, the desert wolf got her nails and she stabbed Malia and Malia's eyes are like glowing now. But she didn't realize that Styles had given Malia the talons and Malia has them on now and Malia looks at her and then she sticks her, uh, her nails into uh, the desert wolf and we see both their eyes are like that piercing glowing blue and it's like They have like this exchange of this look and then you see uh, slowly that the blue starts to fade out of Corinne's eyes and I believe Okay, it appears that Malia took all of Corinne's powers like the last bit that she had she drew them out of her and Corinne's collapse or she like looks all sick or whatever she's about to collapse she turns around and Brayden hits her on the head and knocks her out I kind of wanted Corinne to die off I, I'm just being honest here I think that for the hype of this she should have just like they should have like killed her off in a way I knew she wasn't going to but I wanted them to because they built this whole thing up so much that I wanted there to be like more. Overall this is a really really intense scene but I believe drawing those powers from Corinne also healed Malia so she wasn't hurt anymore. That was really cool to me. I thought like it was like it was enough. An interesting part about that scene with Malia and Corinne was when Corinne jabbed her nails into Malia she told her I want my powers back but when Malia jabbed her nails into Corinne she told her I want my family back that is so much like so much that like finally like she was able to get it out like we know that Corinne was the cause of Malia to have her mom die and her little sister her adopted family but at that point it just made it like kind of like satiated like I felt like finally you were able to tell her off while getting even with her or getting the better of her so really cool and then we see Styles, and he's like can somebody get this glass out of me and uh, I'm gonna assume like you know that's they took him to the hospital I don't know I don't know where they took him Deaton's maybe but that's where we're left off with that I was so satisfied with that whole scene. I was, it was great. So the resolution of the episode, the falling out action, everything comes to an end, right? So we go and we see uh, Chris and he's bandaging up Gerard and obviously they didn't kill each other and Chris just obviously nicked Gerard or shot him in the arm to not hurt him. After all, it is his dad. Um, what else happened? Uh, we see Dean and he's um, telling um, Hayden that he did all he could for her whether or not she'll heal is in question because as we know the chimeras tend to reject 
um, uh, foreign things in their body, things that can't heal them. So she's still at this point dying and she's like, I want to do this. And Scott finally gives her the bite. And we see after that, um, Liam and Hayden and they're like, I don't know, in the woods, wherever they're at. And they look at each other and their eyes both glow that honey amber color or yellowish color, which let us know that she's genetically, um, officially and like in every way an actual supernatural being. I'm not sure if she's going to be a werewolf now or if she's going to still be um, a, a jaguar or the rare dra jaguars um, because that's what she was when she was a chimera. So I don't know if maybe they're going to like say she's a werewolf now. I don't know. I want to see what's going to happen with that because that's really interesting. Kira and Scott and their and that desert part and their uh, Scott's saying goodbye to her because she's promised the skinwalkers that she would stay with them to learn what she had to. That was a part of the deal when they said that everything comes at a price. They were going to help her, let her figure out how to like save her friends in order for her to stay. And she tells them it's not for them, it's not for her mom, her dad, for anybody. It's for her and she wants to do that. And he asked her how long it's going to take and she said however long it takes. So we're left with Kara there, and I, I feel like it's hopeful for them still. I don't think they're going to make Kara and Scott break up. I, don't, I hope not, at least, but it was a really cute moment. It was during that point with uh, Liam, Scene, and Hayden's, and Scott and Kara's that everything went really CGI, like the backgrounds, and that's, that's the part I was saying early on in, the, in this video, that I didn't quite enjoy the graphics or, like, the editing of the vid or the show itself not the scene itself because i love these scenes i thought they were great but i just didn't like the backgrounds looking so like like com like they just like computerized and i know i like the backgrounds that they normally have which look realistic this one just didn't and it didn't do it for me and i was talking to somebody else too and he was like no i didn't really like that either so i don't know they hopefully they don't keep doing that but you know Let's just go past that. Let's just let's put it to rest now, okay? So the next scene, which was a really good scene too, I liked it. It was Styles and Lydia, and they're in school, and um, Styles and her are talking, and this is what he says. He says, when we started this year, I was so freaked out about everyone ending up in the same place after we graduated. And if we remember in the beginning of 5A, he was trying to figure out how they could all stick together and he had his plan and they're all talking about Styles' plan. So that's what he's kind of ringing back in right there. And he says, but I don't think it matters. We always seem to find each other anyway, even Allison. And um, Lydia kind of looks like, what do you mean? And then he begins to tell her how Sebastian seen Allison, but he thought it was Marie Jean who created a distraction which ended up saving Scott so and he tells her uh, she saved him Allison saved Scott I really like that because at their biggest moment and their biggest foe that they've had to go against Allison was still in a way there and she was still able to help Scott and she was still able to make a difference and to matter within the group and you know to me I like that because it kind of shows that she's still like in essence still part of the pack they still carry her with them and that's what I really liked and while Scott uh, or while Styles and Lydia are talking Scott's in the library at the school and he looks hopeful and he looks happy and he's gonna go and study and he looks up and he um, he ends up walking up to where the seniors write their names um, and he's seen Allison's name and had the AA on it and when he was looking he was like reminiscing he had a smile on his face and everything looked alive again and he looked back down and uh, he seen downstairs that uh, Styles and Lydia were going like where he had Scott had his books and stuff and they're gonna go and study there and he walks down and they have a, like a really happy moment and that happens to be my background which is why I chose that background because I thought like that just was like 
that's what we needed for the show and one thing I really like is that the background is lit okay like everything now like this whole season has been like the lighting of the show has been really dark but this part of it and towards the end everything seemed bright again like it kind of just gave you like hope and like really like this is what I needed to see it was really 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 fulfilling to me and I was just like wow I couldn't have been happier with that being the ending like like this is it this is like how it started I mean minus Allison but I mean in spirit she's there I mean it was Scott and Styles and Lydia and Allison and that's like how like it brought us it brought me back and I was like oh, I really like this it was really great. Um, before the scene, actually, we seen Lydia and Malia, and they're getting to school, and they're looking, and like they look hopeful and happy, and like their friendship's going strong. It's like this is, this is how it started, you know, and this is I feel how it's gonna like progress. I thought this was gonna be the ending. I thought the scene behind me was the end scene. I was wrong. Okay, and I was thinking like, wait, well, what's going on here? So they take us back and we're in that place where Mason was hooked up to some tank that had all that green liquid in it. And um, that thing was inside there that um, that was connected to Mason. Remember that looked like whatever that dread doctors are underneath their mask, like gross. And um, whatever that thing was not in there anymore, the tank was drained. And there was only a little bit of green liquid in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they show on the floor a set of footprints, wet footprints, that lead off. And then it leads off with two, like, prints of the white, not white, right side of the foot. So, I don't know. I'm wondering if something, like, got out, if that thing that was in the tank got out, or if it's not over yet, or... I don't know. That was really weird and really... It just like took me off guard. I was thinking like, wait, they're not done with that? What happened? So I don't know. I'm really excited to find out what's gonna happen with that and what the next season has to bring and what kind of shenanigans the pack's gonna get themselves into. <clears throat> Overall, this finale was exactly, I think, what we as fans needed and wanted out of it. And we got so much and there was so much like, satisfaction and everything was done well i couldn't say enough how great this season was or how great this episode was and if you have any questions if you have any comments if you want to talk about this show i'm all willing and please please leave us some comments in the comment section we'll get back to you as soon as we can uh, that'll do it for my video today please like and subscribe I really appreciate it, and until next time, see you.